and gentlemen, come have a seat, get comfortable. All right, welcome to the Wonder House this afternoon. Come on in, guys, come in, come, come sit. All right, we're super excited this afternoon to introduce one of the modern wonders of the world and talk a little bit about the science. And I'm talking about Biosphere 2 that we are thrilled to have at the Wonder House where it belongs, which is cool. And if you think these screens are big and what you see here, you're just gonna have to come and see the largest earth science living laboratory in the world. It was just a little north of my hometown, Tucson. And to talk about it and to talk about the incredible science that's happening at Biosphere 2, we have Jos van Haren, who is the Director of Rainforest Research and uh, assistant, professor, uh, assistant Professor of Practice at the W.A. Frankie Honors College, and John Adams, who is the Deputy Director and COO and Chief Advocate for the Biosphere 2. So without further ado, please welcome John and Joost. <laughs> Well, thank you, Misha, for that introduction, and, and it's great to see all of you here. Um, I'm John Adams, my colleague, Jos van Heren. Um, but... <laughs> so I think we've all seen this image, and you'll hear it as Earth, the blue marble, but it's Biosphere 1. And I think one of the things that we often forget about is that it's a closed system. Okay, so we're not going to get any more resources. And the only thing that's really increasing is you and I on the planet. And so we've got to understand how we're going to be able to use those resources more efficiently. Now, what do we often spend a lot of time doing, though? We don't often have that perspective to look at Earth from space. We're looking at from Earth out into space. And so originally, the Biospherians who built Biosphere 2, um, we're going to talk about that here in a minute, you know, they were looking in part to try to understand Earth systems. What do we have here, and how do we take what we need to be able to go and set up a colony on the moon, maybe go to Mars? Because everything that we need is right here on Earth. But we don't find those same resources when we go into another planet, okay? So that's a real concern if you're looking at it. But fundamentally, we've got to understand Earth systems, okay? And so how do we do that? And so you build a facility like Biosphere 2. Can you capture some of those processes that you have on Earth that are so critical for you and I to exist and be able to have a closed system just like Earth is and let me interrupt you here for a second, John, before we go to this slide. One of the key things about Earth and we humans on this planet is that we are doing a massive planetary scale experiment that is uncontrolled and we don't really know what's going to happen. And I think that Biosphere 2 is going to help us understand some of these things that we are doing and how ecosystems are going to respond to that. But before we could build a facility like Biosphere 2, there's been pioneers who have looked at what does it actually take and can we capture some of these processes. So this gentleman over here looking at this flask, and what he did, his name is Claire Folsom, he went around, he bottled up seawater and other waters, capped it to see if it would actually live. Maybe some of you here in the audience, have you guys ever built a bio bottle where you take a two liter bottle, you put some water, you put some grass, maybe you put a fish in there, and you, bought, and you close the lid to see if it grows. Now, I did that, I think, when I was in sixth or seventh grade, and I, I know my, my partner's, hers looked great. Mine just turned into a big slime, okay? It didn't look very good at all. And that's to the point, though, it's that these systems are so complicated, and a lot of times we just don't know what these processes are and how we bring them together, because Earth is so complex. Now, people have been doing this. So the Russians have been doing this, so this is BIOS 3, and this facility, and I'm going to tell you how big Biosphere is after this, but this facility was about 1,400 square feet. So imagine this room here, maybe the kitchen and one of the side rooms. That's about the area, and they put in wheat and some other plants. They had people living inside of it, but it wasn't really a system. Think about Earth. There's lots of different components. It's not just one type of plant, but it's hundreds of thousands of different types of plants. It's not just a little bit of water, but it's millions and millions and billions of gallons of water. Now, these folks, this is a little bit more modern, 
this facility is about 1,700 square feet. So imagine this room, the kitchen, maybe the big room that you came into. So about the size of a modest house. And this is in China, the Chinese Lunar Palace. And they lived inside of this where they had living spaces, but they were growing agricultural crops. So again, several different types of crops, but again, not a system. And they made it for about a year. Well, this group of pioneers, these biospherians, they had an idea. Could we actually capture more than just one type of plant or two types of plant, but could we actually bring steel, water, plants and put them inside of a completely enclosed environment and have that environment balanced in a way that's going to produce the oxygen that you need to breathe and the food that you're going to need to eat. And so biosphere is not 1,700 square feet or 1,300 square feet, but we're talking about 137,000 square feet or a little over three acres in size. Now, what do they put inside of it? They wanted to capture some of those critical biomes or these systems that we have on Earth. So we've all heard of rainforest. So we've got a tropical rainforest. We have a savanna. We have a mangrove area. So if you've ever been down to South Florida, we've got mangrove trees in there. We've got a subtropical thorn scrub. We have a coastal fog desert. These are deserts that you find on the western edge of many continents. Um, we also had a separate space where they grew their agricultural crops to try to grow as much food as they were going to need. They had a separate space where they lived, so they had a habitat. And these really cool sort of dome that you see there is the lung. That was designed to regulate air pressure because Biosphere 2, when it was sealed, it leaked less than your typical building by a thousand times. And in fact, its leak rate on some cases, depending on what module is attached to the International Space Station, actually rivaled it. It only lost about 10% of its oxygen annually. When you seal it like that, you got to control pressure, and that lung was designed to do that. Now, eight people decided, we're going to live inside there, and we're going to make a go at it. Now, how many of you, let's see, came together? Raise your hand if you came with a group of folks. Okay. So if I took, okay, so you got you two, you know each other, and then I took maybe the other four or five over there, I stuck you in a room and I said, okay, for the next two years, you're going to have to depend on one another. You're going to have to really get along and work together as a team. And you're going to tell me that you're going to have everything go perfectly. No, it didn't. I mean, we're humans. We, we don't get along. Okay. Um, and so that's one of the challenges. The other challenge was, is that th that farm area, even though it was a half acre of that whole three acre facility, it only, it, it was highly productive, but it didn't produce enough calories for them. So they were always hungry. Nutritionally, they were okay, but they were always hungry. So you, you're not going to always get along. You're hungry. And one of the big challenges that they had inside was when they closed this door and they sealed themselves inside, what happened? This happened, okay? they didn't quite have things balanced right. And so oxygen started to go down. So for outside, oxygen's about 21%. It dropped down at about day 500 into their two-year mission inside to 14.2%. They had a difficult time breathing. And the reason why is they didn't quite understand the balance between how many plants and the size of the plants and the growth of the plants and what was in the soils. Because what they put in the rainforest soils and the agricultural soils was nutrients to support that intensive growth. But what they didn't account for is just how active the microbes, those things that we can't see, were going to be. So there's microbial respiration, the giving off of CO2, the taking in of oxygen, outpaced the ability for plants to photosynthesize. Taking in that, that CO2, splitting water, and giving off oxygen for breathe. And if I may add, there was another extra component there, and that was actually the concrete, the building itself it took up the carbon dioxide that was produced in the soil. And so with that, became an effective sink for all that oxygen that was produced. But to me, this is, as a scientist, this is critically important, what happened to them. And a lot of people would say, oh, that's a failure. You can't lock people in like that. However, it showed that Biosphere 2 has a small amount of atmosphere and a lot of biology. And so it acts as a magnifying glass, how the biology or the ecosystems interact with the atmosphere. And so we can actually use that to look at how these interactions work and then do the detective work, what actually happened. 
Well, and, and this brings us to the transition of Biosphere. So today, Biosphere 2 no longer has people living inside. In fact, we've moved away from living people inside. We're just too complex to figure it out. We've got to figure out our systems first. Okay? So, but I really like to think of Biosphere 2 as the collider for the Earth sciences. So this one over here, we have the Large Hadron Collider. We're smashing atoms together. What are those fundamental building blocks? The University of Arizona world-renowned for building the most sophisticated telescopes in the world, to look to the ends of the universe. But what tool do we have that's at the same scale of this collider, of this giant Magellan telescope, that allows us to look at Earth systems? Biosphere 2 is that tool. And it was built private with private dollars and is now in the public sector for Yost and his colleagues to use to conduct research. And so now Yost is going to tell us a little bit about the research that's going on and some of those significant research outcomes that we have. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> what I will do is actually focus on, so again, back to this magnifying glass, and focus on the rainforest, the ocean, and the LEO space, which stands for Landscape Evolution Observatory. But the key thing is, this, again, this magnifying a glass. Being able to observe, because honestly, and as Joella knows, actually to f measure things in the real world is very, very hard. And so with that, most of the time we have to develop the instrumentation to be able to get at that. Well, Biosphere 2 is a, a, two is a tool because things build up so much more that it's much easier to measure the changes. And so with that, then it's becomes easier to, what, to figure out what do we really have to look for in the real world. And I'll come back to that in the, when, when I talk about the rainforest. But it's not necessarily just a, a tool as a magnifying glass, but it also is a sort of sits in a sweet spot of complexity versus scale. And, and right now, most of our models are informed, and the way that we look at Earth system models is informed based on these little experiments that people do with potted plants in a growth chamber, because we can control the variables really well in there. Well, the problem with that is that that doesn't uh, capture the complexity of the real world, these big, massive forests that are so hyper-diverse and have all these different interactions. Well, Biosphere 2 sits in that sweet spot in the middle. We have both complexity, we have both fully grown plants in there, and we have the interactions between all the different species. So with that, we actually, when we do manipulations, it actually is much closer to that, where we want to, to be able to make projections for, than just a potter plant. So go us before you go too far. So I had a great question from a visitor to Bias for Two, and she asked me, well, why can't you just run simulations? Run that model over? And I said, you know, that's a great question. The reason is, is that the models are only as good as the data that we put into there. And so we need these scales that Yost referred to to be able to better inform those models. And I'll come back to that one, too, in a minute. So what are the key things that we're looking at? And we have divided up in what we call the grand challenges of big questions we're asking. One is about water. Being in Arizona, of course, we have to include water. And trying to get at how does water move through the landscape. Then, because we have a rainforest and we have an ocean inside Biosphere 2, we focus on the responses of two of the most diverse ecosystems in, on the planet, the rainforest and the coral reef ecosystems. And then thirdly, by, at Biosphere 2, we have actually a great opportunity to do some experiments where we mix energy production and food production. Right? And how, what does that actually do? And how can we actually maximize both land use, but also then minimize the water use and, uh, and maximize the energy input that we're taking? So, let's start with that water flow. So, for that, we built the largest geoscience experiment on the planet. Uh, this is only one of the three hill slopes that we built. There are three of those. There are about a million pounds each. They are about 33 feet wide, three feet deep, and 100 feet long. And that really, we designed those with about 1,800 sensors in each of those to try to figure out how does rain, when it falls on the landscape, move it to the river? And you think it's like, oh, that's an easy question. Well. When we started out the first time and added water to the system, we had a model make the predictions. This is how much you can put in there so that you actually have the water flowing in and the water flowing out. The model got it wrong. 
we immediately developed a canyon in uh, the landscape, and that was not supposed to happen. So clearly, these models need adjustments and need improvement. Right now, 10 years later, actually those models are actually getting the pr predictions right. And so we can make, have the model say, you need to put in so much water to actually have this happen. And we know where the water goes, and we can actually make those models predict those things, uh, the, 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 the locations of the water and how much flows through correctly. But it took us 10 years. Now, we're going to step, uh, step two. We're going to add plants. And as Travis Huxman, who was the, the main lead scientist behind this experiment, said another fantastic question, how are plants going to muck up a perfectly good hydrological and biogeochemical systems? Because we know the models are going to be failing again once we add the plants to the system. But that's what we want to do, right? because we need to understand better how these models make their predictions and whether they are indeed holding true. Yeah, and you know, one of our colleagues also said, and I think this really hit home for me, is that, as Joe said, it rains in the mountains. How much of that water ends up downstream from you and I to use? And what impacts the quality of that as you have land change? Whether that's something that you and I have done or you have a fire that sweeps across the landscape, LEO is allowing our researchers, the Landscape Evolution Observatory, to gain greater insight. The ocean. So the Biosphere Ocean uh, to Ocean is about a million gallon tank of salt water, of course. In the deepest point, it's about 21 feet or 7 meters. And then it's modeled after, was originally modeled after a Caribbean coral reef system. And previous research we actually done in, inside this rainforest, of, excuse me, inside this ocean. I, I am the rainforest director, so I want to hurry up to the rainforest <laughs> quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Joel, and I will spend my time on the ocean. But the early research showed that, well, people know about coral bleaching, right? Temperature increases, and with that, that symbiosis of the al uh, algae and the corals go wrong, and with that, the corals bleach. And that's a direct temperature effect. But there is an even more direct temp uh, effect due to increase in carbon dioxide. And that is the carbon dioxide actually goes into the ocean water, makes it more acidic, and makes it more difficult for coral growing organisms, especially calcifying organisms, to actually grow. So it's not just a temperature increase. No, it's actually a double whammy of temperature increase and increase in acidity in the ocean. Now, at Biosphere 2, right now, our ocean and coral reef system is degraded. And so what we can actually do is use it as a model ecosystem to try to, how do we regenerate um, coral reef ecosystems? And how can we actually add different organisms to actually start that regeneration process? And this is a collaborative work spearheaded by Anna Th Diana Thompson at the University of Arizona, where they're actually looking at bringing potentially, in, uh, potentially GMO organisms, uh, coral reef organisms in, and can they actually survive these bigger temperatures? Because again, we have the capacity in this ocean to not just change the temperature, but we also can change this, uh, the acidity. We can make, can make these chemical changes as well as environmental changes to then see how do these organisms respond to that and really push the limit on them. And that's one of the key things. Now, hopefully, we don't end up like that, and we can actually restore that. But we want to get back to functioning coral reef ecosystems. And I, we really think the Biosphere 2 ocean is one of the ideal places to do it, because right, do we really want to release all these GMO coral reef systems in like the Great Barrier Reef, and we don't know what's going to happen? Right? Biosphere 2 is a great testing ground for that. All right, my home turf. So this is the, uh, an image of the Biosphere 2 rainforest. And as you can see, it's not a little pot of plant. <laughs> right? These are trees that are 100 feet tall. Uh, they're oh, we are pretty much about 30, 40 centimeters in girth. Right? Big, big trees. And we have been using this as a system to look at how do tropical forest trees respond to climate change. Well, and climate change for tropical forests means increasing carbon dioxide concentration, 
increasing temperature and increasing drought. And so we've been doing multiple experimentation over the, over the years. With carbon dioxide, there is an increase. We know that's happening, and it's actually plant food, right? Photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide is taken up for the plants. Well, it's only to a limit. It's like, like in, if you are hungry and you have some rice to eat, giving you more rice is not going to make you much better and make you grow more. You need other nutrients. And that's one of the problems with the increase in carbon dioxide. We, the plants need other nutrients. So they will respond to a small little bit, but then they have had enough. Temperature. Well, it turns out that actually this biosphere too, even though we can control conditions and we can actually change conditions, we're still in a greenhouse. It means that temperatures get really hot. Right, right up underneath the glass, we can't control against that necessarily. And so the canopy of this rainforest has seen temperatures well above what normal rainforests see, about 10 to 15 degrees centigrade higher. Right? And it's predicted for the Amazon rainforest to be about uh, 6 to 8 degrees centigrade higher in the next 100 years. So the cool thing about Biosphere 2 is that all these plants, all these trees are happy in here. They're still growing well. So it suggests that tropical forests are much more resilient to increasing temperature than people have given them credit for. Now, there's one caveat. It's a positive, but I'm going to add your caveat right now. <laughs> and that is they need moisture. As long as they have enough moisture, like they can handle any temperature that we give them but if it would get drier and hotter at the same time, then tropical forests are going to be much more in trouble. Now, we did a big drought experiment, and this is the Biosphere 2 Wald experiment. Uh, it was actually led by a group out of Germany, out of the University of Freiburg. Anybody who speaks German, Wald? Forest, yes. <laughs> so it's a German word for forest. And it also, of course, we scientists have to think of, of an acronym. So it's water, atmosphere, life, dynamics at the same time, too. Right? But one of the interesting things that we did during that experiment, we did a big drought. 65 days, absolutely no water. Right? No place in the, in the world that you can do that. Right? Because we can just turn off the spigot, and it's going to be a drought. We added carbon-13, a stabilizer dope, which is acts like a dye or a tracer. And we can follow that then through how, when the leaves take it up with uh, the photosynthesis. And this was actually a very interesting moment because Christiana Werner, the lead PI, and I, actually, when we opened up the bottle, and mind you, this was pure carbon-13 CO2, $20,000. We just blew it up in the air <laughs> and let it go. Cool thing about Biosphere 2, again, it's, we can make it a closed system so it all stays in there for the plants to use. And then we can see what did the plants use it for. The most amazing thing was that we found two things. One is that there are these chemical compounds called monoterpenes, and they often exist as, as what we call chiral or mirror image compounds. So they are chemically completely identical. They're just like your two hands. They look sort of like opposites of each other turns out these plants make them from different sources. So in one of these mirror images, we actually saw it come back with that label in it, so suggesting that it, it's fixed, uh, based on newly fixed carbon that was just, made, just taken up by the plant, and the other was from stored carbon, old carbon. Right, so there is different pathways, again, showing that we need to adjust these models. These models are not necessarily done right based on the bio biology. And we need to look at these ecosystems, how they really respond in great detail, so we can actually make those models better. The other thing was that as the drought went on, we did it at the end of the drought again in addition. And we found that that production of those monoterpenes had shifted to later in the day. Now, you go like, well, why would plants do that? Why would they change that? Well, it turns out that these monoterpenes are actually what are called cloud condensation nuclei. So once they are in the atmosphere, water goes and absorbs to those molecules and makes droplets and makes clouds happen. So the suggestion being, and right now the lead scientist on that project is working in the Amazon basin to really test this out, is are trees seeding their own clouds during drought? 
right? Are they actually responding to that? So these are the kind of sort of tantalizing things we can do at Biosphere 2 by having both this closed system as well as the control over the environmental conditions to actually look at these interesting factors that normally would not have been able to see. So before you go to the next one, you say, oh, talk I went up. Tantalizing. So Yost has just planted over 150 new trees in the rainforest. And I know two of these trees you're going to recognize because they're near and dear to all of our hearts, at least mine, is a bunch of coffee trees and a bunch of cacao trees. So you need to, you need, so, so chocolate. So you need to stay tuned because what he's looking at is how are they doing as they experience extremes in temperature. So we've got some planted in one area, some planted in another area, and we can look at that temperature gradient. How does that affect bean production? fruit production and their actual survivability? Because honestly, we don't know. Coffee, for instance, you might know. It's actually a high elevation, cold, tropical forest species. Well, are they going to be moved out of their comfort zone? And thus, that it's the second most traded commodity on the planet, only after oil. Right? It's, it's a massive commodity. So the last thing I want to talk about is this you see these all these solar panels, but you notice that normally if you go and look at, at big solar farms, you see just bare ground around them. Well, Greg Bear and Gafford, together with colleagues, have started this project with what if we actually mix the agriculture together with the solar production? Right? What do we can do? Well, it turns out when you mix those two together, it actually makes the solar panels more efficient because the transpiration, the water leaving the leaves on the plants, actually helps cool down the solar panels, making, making them more efficient. But the other thing is that the shading of those solar panels makes the plants more efficient, and it actually makes them more water efficient. Well, what else do we want in, this, in the Arizona desert? And especially with mega droughts, we want to have more water efficient plants because, as we just heard in the previous talk, Plants use 80% of all our water that we actually put out on uh, the ecosystems and that, that we actually overall know on our water use. So this seems to be like a win-win situation. Now again, we have the scaling up issue. And that's one thing that Gabriel and Gafford is working on and hopefully being able to solve in the next 10 years. Well, and you know, the agrovoltaic, so that's the mashing of photovoltaics and agriculture into two words. But what Greg has shown is that the agricultural crops that grow underneath those panels use, right out of the gate, 50% less water than they would have if they're growing out in full sun. I mean, that's incredible. And now what he's doing is how far can he actually push them? You know, can he reduce it by 60, 70, 80%? Which species are sort of optimal to grow underneath of there? So there's a lot of research, but he is doing some incredible foundational work to better understand this. And, and the key thing that he says is like, it's not just about using the land and really making sure that we use it correctly, but we can actually doubly use our land, both produce energy and our agricultural crops at the same time, with both with a bonus, using less water, and creating more in energy. So Yost and I thank you very much. This is a, a video behind you. It's going to sort of highlight a lot of things that we've talked about. But really tune in and follow us through social media, our website, where Yost and others, we're always giving updates, what we're doing, how we're using these systems. And we've got an incredible team, whether it's the rainforest team, the ocean team, the folks working outside on agrivoltaics, or those working on the Landscape Evolution Observatory. So we thank you very much for this opportunity, and we, we open it up to any questions you may have. Uh, so, as a uh, first, as one of the uh, founders of South by Interactive, thank you for being speakers here. Thank you for Arizona being here. Mm -hmm. uh, now, as one of the 6,000 UN Ocean Ambassadors, and having been to the biosphere with my uncle 20 or 30 years ago, have we learned much that can give us hope, something I can take to talk to people that we think we're figuring out a way. Because this is, basically, this is a micro experiment of what we're heading for. Mm -hmm. So, have, is there any, is there enough ray of hope that we're going to be able to... So, let me, I'm going to start with the reef one, and then you go to the rainforest. So, yes, there is hope. So, in that photo that Yo showed where there was that bleaching, bleached coral, 
And right next to it, there was that living coral. So what we see when you have these massive events, yes, it's devastating. One of our collaborators at the University of Hawaii lost 90% of her specimens on her field site in like a three month period, she said. But what's hope is that there are individuals that survive. And what she had said, her name is Ruth Gates. Unfortunately, she recently passed. But if you ever have an opportunity, watch Chasing Corals. And it's a great video. But what she said is that there is hope because she felt that we can use engineering in some respects to repopulate the reefs with more resilient corals. And that those things that we're first afraid to do in nature, we can do inside of a facility like Biosphere 2 to understand what those implications are. And I want to add that actually a lot of the, especially in the Great Barrier Reef system, it's not just the climate that is actually driving it, it's not just the CO2, it's actually land use and actually having waste going on to these coral reef ecosystems. And so I think there we have a much better chance of actually reducing that. Now, for the rainforest, have you ever going to talk about the rainforest? And I highly recommend it. Uh, there is hope. There are models out there out of the early 2000s that say it's like, okay, the Amazon basin is going to transfer over to a savanna in the next 100 years. Absolutely not in my mind. And Biosphere 2 actually is the rainforest that shows it. Right? Much hotter temperatures, they can really handle well. Uh, they really can handle drought trees. They're actually so much more adaptive than we have given them credit to. With drought, they're much deeper rooted. So I do think that there is a lot more resilience. There's going to be remain a forest. However, there is definitely a lot of die-off that's going to happen. And so there is still a lot of diversity that's unknown in tropical forests even. Right? And so we need to make sure that we invest into the research and actually trying to better understand what is that diversity and what are the critical components that we need to preserve. But there is going to remain tropical forest, no doubt. I love how the Biosphere 2 is made out of like these little geometric elements, triangles and squares and hexagons, and I hardly ever see that in any other architecture. Did you guys invent it, and has it been copied anywhere? <laughs> yeah, so we didn't invent it. Um, it was that original group, but uh, no, that's a great question. So they, they wanted to have as much open space as they could. They didn't want to have to supplementally light. Um, so this was a design feature that was critical when they were looking at building it. And uh, one of the folks, his name is Mark Nelson, when you know, he was asked, he was one of the original Biospherians, you know, why didn't you guys just build sort of a big greenhouse-like structure that was square in nature or maybe slightly arched? He said, you know, we wanted it to have architectural significance and resonate with people. But also, they worked with a company out of California called Pierce Structures. And so these interlocking, there's basically tubes of steel, uh, allowed them to have that openness without having to have massive beams. And in fact, each one of the nodes where they come together, they actually can support about 5,000 pounds. So it's extremely strong. We can actually take out like a 10 by 10 section and not have the whole thing come crashing down. And it allows for as much light to be able to transmit it through to support all the growth that's inside. Um, I wanted to talk about the rainforest. In okay. Or, you know, Thank you. Many of the um, yeah, the rainforest in particular. Uh, how does the absence of organisms affect your research, like you know, fungi and animals? And stuff? So the second one you mentioned, the animals, is definitely a big miss. miss we're missing that. And honestly, I will not be able to go out every day to feed the animals because even though it's a large, right, it's, it's, it's about 120 by 120 feet or about just over 40 meters by 40 meters. So it seems large when you're in there, but to support animals, it's tiny, right? Imagine an elephant going through there. It's like, no, oh, come on, or a gorilla for that matter. So no, we don't. And yes, of course, that affects uh, what's going on. There are certain things like herbivory, um, moving species around. Like, for instance, one thing that we do not have much is actually regrowth. And, and John mentioned it's like we're, we're planting uh, or just planted 150 trees. Well, that's a role that we're taking on. The regeneration of trees is something we have taken on ourselves. So we're looking at these kind of ecosystems not as a perfect replica 
of what is out there in the real world. Because honestly, if we would do it already in 30 years, would have diverged from something that's out there. And so we would not be able to have a perfect replica. But that's not what we're looking for. What we're doing at Biosphere 2 is, is do these experimentations that then can actually help inform those models. Remember that scale diagram that I showed you, that we're sitting in the sweet spot. Right. And most of those processes that we look at still will go on whether they're animals inside the rainforest or not. Now, animals will change that, absolutely, but that's not something we're going to solve for the models. And I think that that's an extra component that somebody else can figure out. Yeah, but you make a great point. When we, when we think of Earth, that's how precious it is. There's only one. And no matter how many exoplanets we find, how far we look into space, we never find anything that's even remotely as close. And so biosphere's complexity is what's key to it, and trying to capture all those would be impossible, but this is one tool that we can share with the scientific community to give some insight. Hey, hey there. Yeah. Um, this is a two-parter. Okay. So uh, first is, how are you seeing the discoveries of the research that you're doing filter out into the larger world? And then the second part is, on what kind of timeline are you seeing that happen? Well, I mean, that's a great question. That's always, how do we get our, you know, the science that Joellen and the speakers here today, how do we get that out uh, to the broader population? So we do things like this. The one thing Bias for Two truly benefits from is that there has been so much publicity around the facility from its inception. So we didn't initially do that, but we're benefiting from that because many people recognize it. And so that gives us an opportunity to then showcase the things that Yoast and Diane Thompson and Scott Seleska and others are doing at Bias for Two through, you know, we have almost on a weekly basis, we have a documentary group that wants to come through and look at what we're doing, whether it's to use us for a piece or to use us as a backdrop for what they're talking about climate change. So in part, those are the ways that we get to the broader audiences, but Yoast and his team are always publishing data too as well. And of course, with that, we reach a relatively small audience. We have to be realistic as scientists. It's like, even if we publish in Science and Nature, which we actually just did from that world experiment, even then, we just reaching a relatively small group of people. But we have both the visitors directly. We, we have people go through. And honestly, once they can actually talk to us, while they have the tour, they say, it's like, oh, this was the best tour ever. Right? This was the best place to go. Because I actually got to talk to a scientist. I talked to a researcher actually doing their research. Right? And, and so we can have a direct impact with people. Uh, and of course, we try to publish and then try to publicize it through both the, the media within uh, the, the publicists within the University of Arizona. We use other universities as well. Right? We are not... Right? I've sort of talked about the rainforest as my playground, but it's not. Right? I can't do it all on my, on my, by myself. Research is a cooperative uh, venture. The science paper just, we recently published had over 50 authors on it. Right? Because that's how many people were needed and involved in actually doing this kind of research and actually doing it at the scale that we're trying to do at Biosphere 2. Yeah. So those people can then also help spread the word as well. Right? So, and teaching, of course, yes. <laughs> and we teach, uh, that's true. And actually, by now, this, this, this morning, I was uh, on Zoom with my students back at the U of A, and they were analyzing that data that I had collected at Biosphere 2. Right? So it's not just that we actually talk in the classroom about it. No, we actually bring students in. And they get dirty. One student slipped and fell, and she got all muddy in the rainforest. And, uh, and so that's part of doing that research, too. So, what are the new plans for new instrumentation, microsensors, awesomeness? What's up? What's on your docket? What's coming? What are you writing proposals for? What? So, I just put in a proposal. Don't, don't give away all your good ideas. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, I won't, I won't. So, I just put in a proposal uh, to put in canopy walkways. Right, so we have this hottest canopy on the planet, but if you can't really access it, and right now you saw actually the picture earlier on, and I'm going to see if I can go back there, we'll see if it lets me. Uh, yep, I got to go right there. Uh, Jason DeLeo, Mr. 
He's green all over. He can grow plants like no, nobody. But you can see, he actually was climbing through that framework to get to that plant and to measure it. Well, that's... At, at that time, it probably was about 110, 120, 70, 75% relative humidity. He was suffering doing that, right? That's how we right now access, and we can do it. John and I climb in there, in there as well. But if we have much more canopy access through easy walkways, that's one way, right? So actually access, being able to get everywhere. Then secondly, I'm actually having a uh, master's student who is actually designing micro temperature sensors so we can actually get leaf temperatures throughout the canopy. And that all that data is then directly fed back to a central computer system, right? But how do you make it light and small? Uh, these kind of things we're working on. Uh, we're measuring the trees and trying to figure out, it's like, how do trees emit methane? This is a new thing that's coming up in the last 10, 15 years. And it might solve that seasonal variation that we see in the methane emissions. Well, again, there, we need to develop new technologies to do that. We, at the Walt experiment, in the rainforest, in a shack in the rainforest that we built during the, for that experiment, we had over three and a half million dollars worth of equipment. That was needed to do that experiment. Right? And these were proton transfer mass spectrometers, all kinds of fancy equipment that I can bore you with for the next half hour. But <laughs> it is what, it's, it's definitely we are trying to revolutionize things and to push things forward and try to have as many sensors as, as we can to actually pull in more data. And then hopefully share it with everybody, right? That's our key. We have all our data is on our website, right? And so that's part of it as well, because there's so much more than I can deal with. Hopefully that answered your questions. Awesome. Well, if, the, if there's no... Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>